um, internet scanning or how to become your ISP, um, please give a big round of applause to Johannes Click. <laughs> Can you, can you, okay, that's perfect. Yeah, welcome to the talk, First Internet Scanning, Challenges and New Approaches, or How to Become Your Own ISP. My name is Johannes Klick. Um, I'm concentrating on internet scanning, and my second favorite topic is uh, industrial control system, OT hacking. I have discovered in the past several vulnerabilities, industrial control systems, and firewalls that protected them, and also have given some talks at PH days that's in Russia and in Black Hat US, USA about uh, how to find industrial control systems on the internet and then to compromise them. And also, I did some publications on um, academic conferences like the ACM Internet Measurement Conference. So, what is the motivation for the talk, how to set up an infrastructure for scanning the internet repeatedly? So, my problem was that Shodan IO is, uh, does not provide raw data for free, and as a researcher, you are very interested in raw data because you cannot be sure that maybe comprehensive data or manipulated data uh, you will get. And the next problem is that Shodan IO does not provide clean snapshots of the internet. This means they are scanning the internet, but they are not deleting old results. They are putting every time newer results into it. And this means that if you, have, and you think on dynamic IP addresses, you will have the same server twice or, or whatever, how, however multiple times in the database. This means you have no real clean data. Census is very good, also academic projects or in the past, now they got uh, a startup. But they also, since they are now startups, they are not providing the raw data for free. And they also have some inconsistency in the database, I will show later. And the next point is you need to think about uh, that uh, people or, or the persons that are running these, is, is these platforms, they know what are you looking for. And the question is, what are you doing? What are they doing with this data? And the next question is, uh, who might be interested in this data, right? So that's why better to, to scan on your own the internet. Here, a good example from Shodan. We, here you can see for Telnet that Shodan says you have appropriate 5 million Telnet hosts. You're looking on census, they say, oh, it's, a properly, no, it's approximately 3.1 million. And also, our own scans show that we have 3.1 million talent hosts on the internet. If you, there you can see that Shodan has much more systems in the database, caused by the dynamic IPs and not providing clean snapshot scans of the internet. And that's why if you're clicking on, on Shodan on some hosts, you'll see very often that they're not reachable and so on. You maybe know it when you're working with Shodan. On the next point here, you can see inconsistencies on census. On the left side, you can see, I look for, please give me the number of all HTTPS hosts that has responded on port 443. On the right side, I did a similar request. I said, please provide me all hosts that had given you uh, via HTTPS 443 a status code. Status code is that 200, OK, 400, 4, 303, you know what I mean? And, it's, uh, and you need to get a status code for a full handshake on HTTP. So both requests should result in the same number, but they are differing. You, know, you see on the left side, you have 41 million. On quite the uh, equal request, you have 35 million. And there's a big difference. This shows there's some inconsistencies, and that's why I cannot use these data for my research. And uh, I have not, uh, and I have no the raw data access. And that was my final motivation. There was, in the first quarter of this year, there was a new project called Packetel. Packetel are some researchers that said, yeah, there's no raw data. We are scanning the internet, just using mass scan, scanning the internet from one single source IP, and doing it in, in, in a time span of two hours. And then we are providing the, the data for all for free. And then they got some problems with Spam House, because Spam House is very crazy. They have a lot of black hole IPs. Uh, on the internet, and then if, you, if they receive one or two since they say, oh, you're a really, really bad botnet, you're, you're malicious, whatever, and then you're putting you on, on, on a spam list and then block lists and so on. And that problem run Packetel, because their they, 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 ISP said, oh, no, here, you're virtual private, we will kill it, uh, virtual private server, we will kill it, you, will not get, uh, you, have, you cannot scan anymore. And there were also some further stories uh, about Packetel, and then they uh, tried to make Spamhouse angry. And in the end, Brian Krebs 
doxed them, and then they stopped their service. Very funny story. OK, so this talk is about how to set, uh, so, um, how to set up an infrastructure for, for long-term repeated scans. I'm very interested in the distribution of vulnerable or exotic network services, for instance, like uh, industrial control systems or building management systems um, in the internet over the time of different autonomous systems or BGP prefixes. And this talk will explain how to set up this framework. In the first 50%, we will talk about the setup itself. And in the next 50%, we will talk about the results of our scans. So what is the history? Um, first try was, like every other body has did here, probably in the room, just taking a fast scanner and running, uh, and running it on the internet from a single source IP. But that's a really bad idea. You will get blocked very fast and will receive a lot of abuse messages. And a virtual private service provider will kill your service, and you, you, you are not lucky in the end. <laughs> Second try, just rent like 20 virtual private servers for 4 to 10 bucks per month, maybe globally distributed. The results might be getting better because you're using more source IP addresses. But nevertheless, you have a lot of big problems of abuse messages because your service provider will receive abuse messages. They say, oh, you're malicious, you're infected, we have to kill your servers, please clean, please clean your virtual private server. Or you will get kicked out like the Packetel guys. The third try was to rent at slash 29 from an ISP to get your own WhoisDB entry with your own abuse mail contact. Then we thought, OK, we are lucky, now everything will be fine. But the problem was that these automated IDS intrusion systems, they are not only reporting to the abuse mail that's standing in the US entry, they are also sending messages to the maintainer of the IP address block. This means your direct ISP. And then we got the same problem that, uh, uh, that, the, uh, that our ISP got informed that we are malicious, we have a botnet, and whatever. And then uh, we got a lot of trouble. Um, yeah, well, in the end, we, uh, 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 we managed a lot of abuse messages on our own, but in the end, it was too complicated to get in some discussions with the ISP. So the final solution is we got our own ISP. So we become a RIPE member, a RIPE member and get our own autonomous system, a complete slash 22 uh, network. This means uh, 1,024 IP addresses. Sign up fee is approximately 2,000 euros. Membership, membership fee is like about uh, 1,400 bucks. And then uh, we ran two different co-location spaces, got a further slash 29 from another ISP, and then we bought a server for 30,000 euros for the, all the big data management. And uh, yes, and then we used uh, auto replies for our abuse emails. This means if somebody feels annoyed by our scans, he sends abuse messages and get an automatic reply, which explains what we are doing, why we are, why we are doing the research, and how he can uh, and, and what is the way to get excluded from our scans by putting them on our blacklist. The result is that the abuse messages messages reduced by approximately 90%. And that also the IDS message, messages that told us that we are get blocked and so on also massively uh, uh, reduced, and we are, can now do complete the complete abuse message, messages on our own. And this shows that using a slash 24, so like 1,000 IP addresses for source addresses for scanning, works really good. So what is the infrastructure? So at first we have a front end. Then you can click, okay, I want to scan this IP address space. Very often, we are just saying 000 slash 0. This means the complete internet. Then this goes to the scan master. The scan master looks what scan algorithm we have chosen. Then he will um, take the IP4 address space, cut it into small pieces, randomize the IP addresses in the this, in this small pieces, and then it sends to the search node cluster. The search node cluster scans the internet and sends the data to the aggregator. Furthermore, it is very important that if a search node fails, that um, the, the work package the search node has to work on, the, the, or the number of IP addresses, will get reassigned by a scan master to another search node. 
This is a kind of fail-safe, because very often maybe people using ZMAP or distributed ZMAP scanners, they know it. Then a ZMAP uh, uh, server node got broken, and then you have to do some manual work, and then you have to choose to, to look at what was the last IP number, where, and, and, and how, how was the last prime number, and how to, to uh, in the end, go on with your own scan. And that's very important. If you want to set up a global scan infrastructure, you need a kind of scan master that is managing the scans and looking that everything is working. And if not, then you need to kind of have like a kind of recovery procedure. So the search node cluster itself consists of different search nodes and two, two different um, co-location centers. At first, we have a SYN scanner, just sending the masses of SYNs out on the internet. It's self-written Go. And, for, and then we have an app scanner. It's a customized ZGrep version, because ZGrep is a very good tool that supports a lot of protocols. And we added some, some further protocols and, and use this kind uh, of uh, application scanner. And then all the data goes to the aggregator. The task of the aggregator is that if a search node failed, um, and another search node has, 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 uh, has taken over, in the end, the work. Then you have maybe multiple results, and the aggregator aggregates all data and um, pays attention that you will not have multiple results in the database. Then we have data enrichment. That's very important. Just scanning the internet is not sufficient. So maybe you have you know, all the ports, and then you have the application data, like TLS certificates, information, and so on. But you have to enrichment with further data. We have access to the Whois database, so the inlet objects. This means if you're doing Whois 8.8.8, .8 you will receive, oh, that is a company that owns the Whois block, and then maybe stand some information for what is the Whois block used. Then we have also reverse DNS, zero IP, let's say, where is the IP approximately located, and we're using a BGP prefix information, so we're saying, OK, to which announced BGP proof, uh, prefix does this IP belong? And also, we put the information together uh, which, autonomous systems belong, uh, which autonomous system belongs to the IP address. As storage solution, we have chosen Elasticsearch because it's one of the best databases I have ever seen. Recently, since the new version 7.3, it's very good. And here you can see that as a protocols we are currently support. We are concentrating um, very, uh, very strongly on industrial protocols, but we also support uh, the normal protocols. Most of the protocols are from ZGrep itself, but we have also some special protocols like the Phoenix protocol and some other. So now thinking about some numbers and settings. So if you know, you, you really know it, IP addresses we have. Um, approximately 4.3 billion IP addresses. And very often, people are sending all the IP addresses out. But the problem is that only 2.8 billion of these IP addresses are rooted in the internet. This means you can only reach at a maximum of 2.8 billion IP addresses on the internet. So if you get some kind of BGP feed, like if you have your own BGP router, or have a feed to the BGP router, or use KIDAR data, um, you can reduce the, the number of, of TCP SYN packets by 35%, because when you only send the, the TCP IP packets in the rooted IP space, then you can save a lot of, a lot of uh, TCP SYN packets. So you don't need to scan the private IP addresses and so on, right? So, first thing you have to reconsider is that a TCP SYN packet is approximately 70 bytes big. This means 70 bytes multiplied by 2.8 billion IP addresses means that you're just sending data with a single TCP IP scan. 200 gigabyte of data you will, you will send into the internet. But the interesting point is that, uh, uh, that you will, at the maximum, get only reply from 2% of all IP packets you will send out. It's a very easy calculation. The most used protocol on the internet is HTTP. And so you can see that uh, we have 50, 56 million HTTP hosts divided by 2.8 billion rooted IP addresses. It's 2%. This means you have just a hit rate of 2%. 98% of all TCP SYN packets from the 2.8 billion IP addresses are overhead in the end. So next question is using one SYN or two SYN. Every time it's a discussion, we have tested it. Sending doubled SYNs makes no sense because the results get not doubled, right? You see that's um, neglectable in my perspective. You maybe receive some better results, but we can also see on SSH, SSH you, can, uh, you are able to receive worse results. It's the same kind. And it's, for me, it's in the standard derivation. 
So, and also compared to census, you can see that the results, our results, are really comparable to census, that this kind of setup works. Very interesting. Census uses uh, slash 23. We are losing a slash 24. This means we have as twice as source IP addresses, and our results are also some minor better. But you have to keep in mind, census is running much more longer as a service. They are scanning much more internet, and they have maybe a bigger blacklist. So what about Skeet? Very often, people say mass scan, maximum speed. I can't, don't recommend it. If you use the packet data, data they uh, provided it, you can uh, uh, look it up. Then you can see that we, have, we are scanning with scan speed approximately 70 MBit, taking six to seven hours. And uh, then you can see that if you scan from a single source IP, like everybody can do, um, in, a t in a time period of two hours, your data will be degraded by 10 to 30 percent. This means you will see, in a worst case, only two thirds of the whole internet. So, scanning strategies, very interesting point. You see that the um, imagine a new zero day, remote exploitable zero day arrives on Earth, right? And then you're maybe interested to scan the internet very repeatedly, not, not like every week, but like every day or every 10 hours or 20 hours, whatever. Then it's a very good idea to scan the complete internet once and then to rescan only the BGP prefixes with at least one host in it. And this will save you additional 25 to 50 percent of the rooted IPv4 address space and scan time. And I call this BGP prefix hit lists. I've written a paper out, uh, uh, about it, uh, published on the Internet Measurement Conference. If you're interested, please have a look into Very interesting. So next problem was, we are our own ISP. And suddenly, the police arrived and said, ooh, you're doing malicious attempts. Uh, no, no, they do not ask us for doing malicious attempts. They said, who is the owner of this IP address? Who has used this IP address? And then I because we are our own internet service provider, and then we receive it. And then we talked with them and said, now it's, we are the owner of the IP address, and we have used it for the internet scans. And they got some kind of afraid, because normally you are not allowed to get informed that there are some police investigations about you. But then we explained that we are a security researcher, that we are doing good stuff, that we are providing the information, that we are informing people and so on. And then for them it was okay, and we have never heard about it. But in the first moment I have read this email, I got, wow, it was really amazing. Hardware setup. Um, very important if you want to do a lot of internet scans, also with protocol application, data enrichment, and so on. The size uh, of the protocols quite differ. And you can see it's all really big numbers. A single HTTPS scan is about like 700 gigabyte. HTTP is 300 gigabyte. And Telnet is only like 2 gigabyte of data. So therefore, we have bought a big, uh, a big server consisting of an AMD Apex uh, 7551. So we bought two of these CPUs. We have one terabyte RAM. And we use 50% uh, of, the, of the memory for the Elasticsearch heap itself. And we use 50% just for caching. Then we have 40 terabyte of SSD data, because the, uh, the stuff that is cannot sit in the, in the RAM needs to be stored in the SSD, because we need a lot of high I.O. interaction. And then we are running it on a rate now for just performance increasements. And for long touch storage and also copying, uh, copying the data from the index that are uh, running on the right now SSD, we have about 72 terabyte HDDD running in a write 5. So our first problem was when we have <laughs> get it our, our server, we uh, started at HTOP, and we were not able to see our processes because we got so much CPUs, and they got hyper-threaded. It's like 121, uh, 28 uh, uh, CPUs. And first, we need to investigate how to configure our uh, HTOP to see our processes. OK, next interesting point, Elasticsearch. Also, some tweaking points. Um, most people do a really, really big mistake. They are, have maybe a lot of memory, and they're doing just only one Elasticsearch node. But the problem is, if you have your node has, uh, uh, allocates more than 26 gigabytes of, uh, of, of RAM, then the Yavro virtual machine will use 64-bit pointers instead of special compressed OOP 32-bit pointers. Java does some pointer special magic. 
And the problem is when they use 64-bit uh, pointers, then each load of a pointer uses as, as much as twice uh, of, the, of the bandwidth because 62-bit uh, are much bigger than 32-bit pointer, right? So uh, it, this gave us so we are, have divided uh, Elasticsearch into different search nodes, and each uh, and each uh, and each node has a maximum of 26 gigabyte per node, and this has given us an increasement of a th approximately 30 to 40 percent, unbelievable, by just splitting the database into several several processes in the end. If you're interested how Java is doing memory management and so on using Elasticsearch, there's a very good article about it. Just have a look into it. So now let's go into the results. So what we see here, it's the Kibana. It's the front end of, this, uh, uh, of Elasticsearch. And here we have here inter interactive possibility to get a rough overview about the autonomous systems and the structure of the internet. At first, you can see that the most HTTP, uh, HTTP uh, hosts here um, are hosted by Amazon. And then we, have, we, we can go see what is the next biggest autonomous system. OK, we see Akamai. Akamai is one of the biggest content delivery networks we have on the, uh, on the Earth. And then in the second ring, we can see the BGP prefixes. There you can see that Amazon has here 12, uh, slash 12 and announces this area, also in a slash 12, there we have slash 13, and so on. So, and the next step on the third ring, we can see, OK, that is Amazon. We can see that is this specific announced BGP prefix 3208 slash 12. And we can see how is the service distribution inside of this prefix. And that is the way how, how I understand the internet. The internet is not about nations and countries. It's only about autonomous systems, their prefixes, and the internal structure of the prefixes. Which kind of services do they use? And here you can very good see that they use Apache, Nginx, and also some, some other servers. Um, and you can see there's a big difference between Amazon and Akamai. Because here in Akamai, you can see every server in the prefix has the same server banner. Every time it's Akamai Ghost, you will get any information about which kind of web servers are they using. Is it their own web server? Is it Apache or uh, Nginx, whatever? They have just changed the banner. And here you can see the difference between two autonomous systems. Akamai is content delivery provider. Amazon is more kind of a hoster, right? And that's why they have a much more heterogeneous st structure. What I have now done is, we clicked on Amazon and said, OK, let's look into Amazon. How is Amazon structured in detail? And here you can see the different prefixes. And again, the service distribution, you can get a rough overview. It's just about it's the top 10 or top 12 uh, prefixes. And now we are adding the who is information. And now it's getting very interesting. So we have from the inner circle the autonomous system. Then we have the prefix. Now we have the who is description and see who is prefix. And we can see that Amazon is structuring their, pref uh, their, their network. They have a slash 12, and then they have inside a slash 26 standing in the who is database. And we can also see the customer. Here it's Octor Incorporation, right? And then you can go around and can see about the different Amazon customers and see how is Amazon structuring their internet. And then you can look, OK, that's a BGP prefix, that's customer XYZ, that is prefix, who is prefix XYZ. And then you can look, how is the service distribution inside of the who is prefix. You are cutting the network in more slices and getting a, a good understanding about the, uh, about the structure of the complete autonomous system. Here we can have found Zoom. Zoom is a very well-known video conference communication system. And here you can see um, uh, which kind of service they use. We will click on it, just say, OK, I'm interested in how, how, how is Zoom that is hosted on Amazon, how is it structured? They are using a lot of services just called Zoom, but they also use some 1.13.7 service from Nginx and uh, also some Nginx without any kind of version information in the end. So, and using autonomous system information, BGP prefixes, and also who is information gives you a very good overview about the structure of autonomous system and about the internet itself. So, going next, here another zero so let's that was back up. Now here a look into OVH. OVH is one of the third or, or one of the biggest European hoster we have. 
And here you can also see the BGP prefix. Oh, let me go to the presentation mode. Better. So here we can see they use this slash 16, who is say it's, it's for dedicated servers. And then you can see they use the slash 18 from the slash 16 for dedicated servers. Somewhere else, we can see they use the slash 24 from this another slash 16 for failover IPs. This means we get infrastructure information, how are organizing themselves. That's maybe interesting for an attacker or for somebody else, right? So, and then we can also see which kind of services do they use. And we can see that all failover IPs have the same web server in the end. And what we can also do is which kind of web services does OVH at all use. And we can see mostly they use Apache or, or Nginx, Apache, and so on. So we can see here is a, here's a, separate, a list sorted uh, from top down by the major numbers. Very interesting. But then we have a complete another autonomous system. Here we have SSH, a complete another protocol. And, uh, and we can see that GoDaddy does not reveal any kind of information about the internal structure. All who is blocks are the same, and, so, and they are also have the same name like the autonomous system itself. And very interesting, they are using everywhere, like on 90% of all their servers, they are using the same open SSH version. So you can see that GoDaddy is a hoster, right? So there is, there, is, there is a web hoster. So they are completely managing different on a different way than OVH or Amazon is doing, or Akamai. So using this, we have looked for different customers. And if you look in the his description here, you can see you can enumerate a lot of customers from Amazon. It's very interesting. You can see you have Cisco, you have Samsung, you have Zoom, and so on. Next. We can also look how is Amazon structuring their EC2 infrastructure. That's all the cloud stuff and so on. We can see we have a lot of hosts in, in AVH Asia Pacific because they have a very big slash 16 there. And we can see that they use airport abbreviations for the locations of the EC2 clusters. Here we can see it's Dublin. Then we can see they're using CDG, which is, uh, CDG, which stands for Charles de Gaulle. It's France. Then we see FRA, it's Frankfurt, it's, it's Germany, and so on. And that's very interesting. Using all the US information, you're getting a lot of infrastructure information about the autonomous systems and of companies, how are they structuring the network, and for what parts, uh, and you know what they, uh, what they are doing with their, with their subnets. Then you can also do some other first, uh, further interesting analyzations. I have said, please provide me all Microsoft IIS 5.0 servers. Who knows what is the operating system of, of it? It's Windows 2000. And then I, told, uh, then I told my database, please provide me all the subject common names. So we have a list of the subject common names, and we have now a lot of domains that are, that are running on a Microsoft IIS or Windows 2000 server, a very, very old system, like 20 years old. And then we can all, Mostly people say, okay, it's maybe some old service, they have forgotten it to shut it down, whatever. But then we can see here on the right side, it's the start date, the start validity date of the certificate. And there you can see that there are servers they are running for some stuff because old, outdated, forgotten servers get not new SSL certificates, right? People are running Windows 2000 servers, 20 old softwares, not supported since 15 or 10 years, whatever and providing them with new certificates. And that is unbelievable for me to see that people are doing it. And it's also awesome that these Windows systems are still running, right? It's <laughs> OK, now having a look at the dark side. What we also can do is that we can we're also doing some help lead analysis. And I told my database, please provide me uh, 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 an, an overview about all governance agencies, whatever, in Austria and the WHIS database, and that contains a TLS certificate from Fortinet in the end. So we are looking for Fortinet, uh, Fortinet firewalls that are heartbeat vulnerable in Austria on governance agencies in the end. And we can see here that we have find a lot of, uh, um, so it's German, and it stands something like uh, a Bureau of uh, uh, District 1, District 2, and whatever. And then we can see that the issuer organization keyword is Fortinet. So the issuer of the certificate is Fortinet. And on the right side, you can see very good the different uh, versions of the firewalls. 
That was a scan date from 2017. Then I scanned again on the internet in one year later, and now you can see they have replaced the Fortinet firewalls with Sophos appliance, right? Very interesting what you can see using time differential analysis in the end. So, then if you're scanning for industrial control systems, you can also see that that's a scan for a 7 comma Modbus. You can see a very big distribution, and you can see there's a hard correlation for the economic point. So, if you look at the former GDR region here, you have not that much industrial control systems. You have more in the south and the west. You have in north Italy a lot of industrial control systems, hard, big economic area in Italy. In south Italy, you have not that much industrial control systems. Same to Scotland compared to England. It's very interesting that you can, can, can derive the economic power from the internet scans. Very interesting. And we can see it's a very big problem that all was evolved people putting industrial control systems on the internet. Here are some numbers. So it makes sense. S7 stands for Siemens, and we can see Germany has the most number of Siemens industrial control systems, also fully reasonable. So now, next analysis. Um, here we can see, I said, I want to see for heartbeat vulnerable servers um, in, in April 2017. Um, in Afghanistan. And here we can see on the autonomous system, the autonomous system is the Afghan Telecom Government Communication Network. And the who is description is, and that's I have never seen in so detailed who is information. It's a government communication network, district communication, whatever, for the communication of 34 provinces into 357 districts in Kabul, Afghanistan. And now you're looking who is the issuer of the certificate. You can see it's a PFSense firewall. So you can, if you doing these kind of analysis and putting data together with other data, you are very fast finding very interesting results. And I'm sure that the CIA is uh, going on this since, since some years, right? Okay, now we are getting to the real bad point. People are putting in the WHOIS information a lot of stuff. They also say, this is power plant XYZ. I can't believe it, people are doing that. And here we can see it's a, it's a bigger, power, uh, bigger power plant, it's a coal-fired power plant, and here we have a VPN endpoint via HTTPS. And this power plant has a capacity of approximately 500 megawatts, supplying like 1.5 million people. It's not a small power plant, right? So, and now we are looking. The scan date is from 2018, right? So, uh, August 2018. And we can see the certificate got eight, uh, invaded on July. OK, it's one month. It's OK. But in the end, it's a critical infrastructure with an invalid VPN endpoint certificate. Then I did a rescan. I informed them. I emailed them. I contacted them. I got never a reply. And then I rescanned in November. And still again, the certificate is out of debt. And now I did some new scans, and I found that they have updated certificate in April 2019. And it's a fucking critical infrastructure. People should not care about it in the end. So for me, I'm living in Germany. I'm not funny with that. So um, now I will provide you another further very interesting analysis. Um, another power plant. Where is it? Perfectly. So what we have here in the first is we are looking for Kraftwerk, that stands for power plant in German. And we can see we have only here the autonomous system name, the BGP prefix name, and the server banner. That is the information you can see on sensors or showdown because they do not use who is information. Now we are say please enable who is information. And then we can see some very more interesting results in the end. So let's enable the who is information. And then we can see we have RVE. It's a very big German energy company. And uh, the power plant called Niederausem. Looking on Wikipedia, what is Niederausem? Oh, it's just the second largest coal power plant in Germany. This time we have a uh, about like 4 megawatt of energy, of energy capacity in the end. So now that's very interesting. But what is this for a service? Oh, very interesting. It's a Lancom 7111 VPN gateway. Lancom, hmm, for a critical infrastructure, OK. Let's look. Ah, there is a list of end, uh, end of <laughs> services devices, right? Maybe is it the end of service device. Maybe it's like one year old. I don't know. Hmm, let's have a look. How old is this unsupported system? Or 
since when is it not unsupported? And here you can see it's Lancome 711 device is unsupported since May 2010. It's a nine-year-old unsupported VPN gateway, and that is again from the mid of August. It's like uh, one week old, right? So it's recent. We can see it on the internet live. So very interesting. <laughs> Thanks. So now it's getting better, right? Let's look which kind of cipher suite is it supporting. So now let's go back again to the Lancome device, and we can see, oh, it's the securest cipher we have on the world. It's a TLS RC4 cipher, right? Oh, unbelievable, because it's an old system. It's not surprising. But in the end, hell, we have a critis law here in Germany. Energy companies spending a lot of money. How could it possible there's a very, very 10-year-old VPN gateway with an RC4 cipher on a critical infrastructure? I cannot get it, right? So I have a lot of data. I could talk like 20, 30, further minutes, whatever. But uh, it's my wife's sense. I have to stop spending so much time on this data. Um, yeah. So now we are going to the, to the summary. And then I'm very, uh, I want to discuss with you about the results. Okay, so summing it up, um, using raw data of internet scans is very important, and you have to enrich with, with BGP, who is in protocol-specific information. This only gives you the power for complete infrastructure analysis of the internet. There are a lot of so it's very important for you to understand the topology, the, 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 structure, the structure itself, and you can you know, very easy for you then in the end, if you do your own scans and data enrichment, to identify all websites or vulnerabilities that maybe belong to a company, to a critical infrastructure, or maybe to government agencies in the end. Furthermore, how to do this? Here is my small cheat sheet. Get your own AS with a slash 22. This means like 1,024 IP addresses. Scan not faster than 70 Mbit. Use one SIN, two SIN. Makes no, sen makes no sense because you take like twice for a scan and you will send too much data and you will <laughs> get more engaged with industrial, uh, with uh, um, IDS systems. Scanning the internet in two hours from a single source IP, you will only see 10, uh, you, you will only see like uh, 70 to 90 percent of the internet, so it's not a good idea. Or you need, you can do it, but then you know that the data is not very reliable. You can use only, you should only scan BGP prefixes that are rooted, and that way you will save about 35 of your, of your ZIN traffic and time. And if you want to do very fast, repeatedly scans, in a case of a short remote executable vulnerability has maybe released, you should be use BGP prefix hit list, meaning scanning the internet once and then only scanning the BGP prefixes. And this will save you further 25 to 50 percent of the rooted IP44 address space. Thank you very much. If you want to email me or whatever, just email me. And um, I'm living here on the camp at the Garaffel and a big green tent. And if you're interested in scanning, please contact me because a lot of people I know what scanning on themselves and they're not talking to, to each other. And that's why I'm sitting here. I want to uh, explain to you how to scan. And I, I really would like to set up a kind of scan community in the USA. They have a scanning community. And here in Germany, we won't. So please help me come ar around with a beer. And then we can talk about how to scan. And I have also some further interesting information. Yeah, thank you very much. So thank you, Johannes, for a super interesting talk. We have some time for questions. Um, so if you have any questions, please, uh, we re we'll have a microphone shortly. But in the meantime, we'll take a question from the internet. Um, yes, the internet wants to know whether it's possible to access the scan data or uh, where uh, you uh, publish your uh, scan results or your research results. Yeah, so in the end, I'm not publishing the results results because um, I, this talk was aimed to explain you how you can set up your own infrastructure. So you don't need that much money, like 30,000 euros for the server. You can, I just need it because I want to scan a load, uh, a huge load of different uh, pr pr protocols in the end. So this talk, the aim was to show you how to do it 
on your own, but I want to share the information with penetration testers because they need this kind of information to detect the complete attack surface or companies they are dealing with in the end. And it's for me, it's too, too uh, in the end, I do not know what people would do with all these data, and I don't want to be the people, as the guy who is publishing it to maybe to the bad guys, and that I, that's why I only want to provide it to some penetration testers. Okay, a uh, question from the audience. Hello, Naif from Italy. Here. Uh, Hi. Uh, so I'm doing a, a project focused on Italy, doing um, massive scanning, and I come up with uh, an interesting problem that you may already have figured out. Basically, those kind of scan are not aggressive vulnera uh, vulnerability analysis, uh, are basically creating uh, a software inventory from the service you can connect to and speak to. Yeah. Uh, I came up to the problem of, out of a scan, I would like to detect the surface of vulnerabilities. So, uh, get out some kind of indicators that uh, this service is vulnerable or not. And the very simplistic approach is to make a, a matching with a CV database or yep. application version fingerprinting, but I've been told by multiple persons that the amount of a false positive is pretty high. Yes. Do you have any insight on that? Yeah, so you just need to look on, especially Debian. Uh, Debian distribution is it very is doing very often. If there is some kind for a vulnerability, version 111 of a certain web server, they will provide a patch, but they will not increase the minor number of the service. So it's only a potential vulnerability, right, in the end. That's, that's a big problem. And how to just the only way would be try to exploit it, but you cannot do it as a researcher. And there are the bad guys are more uh, in a better position in the end. So we can only say what is a potential, uh, uh, what is a potential vulnerability or, or, or capacity in the end. Yeah. I totally agree with you. That's a big problem, and uh, for this, I have no solution in the end, right now. Next question. Thanks for the talk. Um, have you thought about scanning IPv6 uh, prefixes? Yeah, we have. We have some current, uh, also a research project in it, um, maybe next year. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience or from the internet? Okay, looks like we're done. So again, a big round of applause to Johannes. Thank you. Thanks.